All right, guys, so I am back, and we are going to get into the uh, final part of the chapter of the nail diseases. Um, you also want to know that a person's occupation can put them at a greater risk of nail diseases or uh, bacteria, not bacteria, nail diseases that are caused by microorganisms. Um, most commonly nurses because they're getting their hands dirty all the time, um, doctors, other cosmetologists because you're dealing with people. Anytime you're, or even a vets too or vet techs, you're dealing with um, animals or any kind of waste that can put you at a risk for a nail infection. So, um, infections develop more readily in people who regular, regularly place their hands in harsh cleaning solution. Natural oils are removed from the skin um, by exposure to soaps, solvents, and many other types of substances. Cosmetologists' hands are exposed daily to professional products. The products should be used according to the manufacturer's instructions. So if the manufacturer recommends that you wear gloves, make sure that you do so to protect your skin. You want to contact the product manufacturer if you're not sure how to use the product safely or obtain the MSDS. Um, product manufacturers can provide you additional information. Call them if you have questions, and that's just a general rule for everything, safety-wise in the salon. So on to our first um, nail disease. Also do the little activity up here. I think this one's pretty interesting. Um, research the term scope of practice for medical doctors, dermatologists, and podiatrists. You want to be familiar with what they do, um, as well as the strict limitations placed on a cosmetologist's scope of practice, so you'll better understand what you can't do. So the first um, nail disease is going to be called onyxcosis. Onyxcosis is going to be a deformity or disease of the natural nail. It's kind of like a broad term. So technically something that's bacterial can be defined as an onychosis. Anikia is going to be an inflammation of the nail's matrix, followed by shedding of the natural nail plate. Any break in the skin surrounding nail plate can allow pathogens to infect the matrix. Be careful to avoid injuring sensitive tissues and make sure that all the implements are properly clean and disinfected. Improperly cleaned and disinfected implements um, can cause this and other diseases if accidental injury occurs. So um, I'm trying to see where they have a picture. Of, they don't have a picture of anikia. That's a general term as well, it seems like. Um, onyx, onyx co-cryptosis is going to be an ingrown toenail. That's like the layman's term for ingrown toenail. The scientific term is very long to say. This can affect the fingers of the toes. In this condition, the nail will grow into the sides of the living tissue around the nail. The movement of walking can press the soft tissue up against the nail plate, adding more to this problem. If the tissue around the nail plate is not infected or the nail is not embedded in the flesh, you can carefully trim the corner of the nail in a curved shape to relieve the pressure of the nail groove. However, if there is redness, pain, and swelling or irritation, you may not provide the service. Cosmetologists are not allowed to service ingrown toenails, refer to a physician. I always find too with the feet, it's really, really dangerous because if you nick the feet and they put their feet in a sock in a human environment, you can cause a very serious infection that can potentially lead to amputation, especially if your client is diabetic. Feet issues are a no-no, and this is why I always err on the side of caution and say no, and I explain why. Because this is not in my scope of practice, or if they bring up the argument, oh, Salon XYZ does this. Well, I tell them Salon XYZ is not following proper procedure because we're not allowed to do this. Um, and you always want to say, I, I value. I don't want you to lose your feet. That's where it comes down to. So ingrown toenails, um, sometimes you can refer, you can tell the client if they carefully lift it up and they file it a little bit, that can help it. You also want to avoid cutting the nail too deep because that can also cause a risk of an ingrown toenail. Onyx colonesis is going to be the lifting of the nail plate from the bed without shedding, usually beginning at the free edge, and it continues toward the lunula area, which is the bottom. So it starts here and it works its way down. This is the result of physical injury or trauma or an allergic reaction of the nail bed less often related to a health disorder. It occurs on natural nails when they are filed too aggressively, on nail enhancements when they're improperly removed, or on toenails when clients wear shoes without sufficient room for the toes. There is no indication of an infection or open sores. A basic manicure or pedicure may be given. The nail plate should be short to avoid further injury, and the area underneath the nail plate should be kept clean and dry. If the trauma that caused the onyx colosis is removed, the area will begin to slowly heal itself. Eventually it will grow off the free edge and the hyponychium will reform the seal and will provide the natural barrier. So this condition can heal itself if you catch it early and you're very careful. Um, they give you the picture and you can kind of see it. The nails kind of have a whitish appearance. I've had this in my toenail. It's very painful when I had a leg come crashing down and half of my nail 
it bled, it broke the hyponychium, and what had happened was you can actually see a difference in color. As the nail grew out, the nail bed was nice. However, if the injury is very severe, you can cause permanent damage, the nail might have a little bump in it, it may get a little weak, or you may reduce um, the size of the hyponychium, causing a little bit more depth to the nail, which can also lead to more infection if things get caught in there. I've seen this a lot with older clients. The one lady I had to go in there with a um, curette and take everything out, it was really, really nasty, and that was because of this condition. So they give you a whole bunch of really nasty photos here of um, like athlete's foot and all that. Make sure you Google some of these photos because it kind of helps you resonate like what's what. So this one, onyx comodesis is gonna be the separation and falling off of the nail plate from the nail bed. It can affect the fingernails and toenails. In most cases, it can be traced to a localized infection, injuries to the matrix or a severe systemic illness. Drastic medical procedures such as chemotherapy may also be the cause. Whatever the reason, once the problem is resolved, a new, new, a new nail plate will generally regrow. You actually see this one in the old My Lady book, a member of my mom's book. This condition is also caused by syphilis, and that's usually the old school way of diagnosing it when you're in the more severe stages. Pretty gross, I know, but syphilis is systemic. It goes to the bone tissue and all that, and it can even hide. Um, if the syphilis is severe enough, the whole nails can come off, and it's really, really gross and disgusting. So um, once the problem is resolved, you know, it will grow back hopefully. If onyx comedesis is present, do not apply enhancements to the nail. If there is no indication of an infection or open sores, a basic manicure pedicure service may be given. But I would argue that if they show you that the one picture is pretty grotesque when it sheds, you don't ever want to cause a nail to shed more for a client. So they say, oh, this is loose. You don't want to be like the dentist and wiggle a loose fingernail, loose toenail. No, it sounds kind of gross. That is not something you ever want to do in the salon because it puts yourself at risk, other clients at risk, and causes the client to be at risk for more infection. Um, nail psoriasis, this is actually not going to be an infection. This is very serious. I've actually known someone that's had this and they said the only way to fix this was to go in there with a steroid and inject it and, I'm, and they were like, absolutely not. Um, this is a condition that can be aggravated by the skin underneath the nail. You can also, I just want to add this in by the way, get um, warts that grow under the nail too and that causes a lot of pain. I just want to throw that in there. But nail psoriasis is not infection, not infectious. It affects the surface of the nail plate, causing tiny pits or severe roughness in the surface of the nail. Sometimes these pits occur randomly and they appear in evenly spread rows. It can also um, cause the surface of the nail plate to look like it's been filed with a coarse abrasive and cause a ragged free edge or cause both. People with skin psoriasis often experience this nail disorder. Neither skin nor nail psoriasis is infectious. It can also cause the nail bed to develop a yellowish to reddish spot underneath the nail plate, also called salmon, salmon patches. The condition oniocalesis is also more common and prevalent in people with nail psoriasis. When all these symptoms are present on the nail unit at the same time, nail psoriasis becomes a likely cause of the client's problem nails, and they should be referred to a physician. So the picture of nail psoriasis is pretty grotesque. It's pretty... Um, Cakey, it looks like there's a nice layer on the nails you want to file through. Peroonchia is going to be a bacterial inflammation of the tissue surrounding the nail. Redness, pus, swelling are usually seen in the skin fold adjacent to the nail plate. Individuals who work with their hands in water, such as dishwashers, bartenders, or who must wash their hands continuously, such as healthcare workers, food processors, are going to become more susceptible to this. Um, you're going to get, because the hands are going to become very dry, and if you're constantly washing your hands or your bartender getting alcohol on your hands a lot, alcohol dries the skin, that's going to put your nails at a greater risk of being injured. Um, you want to know that um, it makes them more likely. Because toenails spend a lot of time in warm, moist environment, they're going to be more susceptible to perineaky infections as well. Using moisturizing hand lotions to keep the skin healthy and keep the feet clean and dry will help. So you can prevent this. Um, pyreogenic granuloma is going to be a severe inflammation of the nail in which a lump of red tissues grows up from the nail bed of the nail plate. It may even cause a shedding of the nail or a decaying of the nail right here. It's going to be very painful and it is potentially infectious, so you don't want to have them dip their hand in the paraffin wax because you can spread that. Pyreogenic gran... Um, no, we just covered that. Sorry. Um, Tinea pedis. So tinea is going to be a Latin term for fungus, and pedis is a Latin term for feet. So tinea pedis, fungus of the foot. And that's how you remember that. It's a medical term for athlete's foot, and, and it's going to occur at the bottom of the feet and appear as red itchy rash in the spaces between the toes, more often between the fourth and fifth toe. 
and there is sometimes a small degree of scaling of the skin. Clients with this condition should be advised to wash your feet every day and dry them completely. Because when you dry your feet out, you create that environment that fungi do not like and it causes them to die off and the body to return to normal. Advise the um, clients to wear cotton socks, change them at least twice per day. They should also avoid wearing the same pairs of shoes every day since the shoes can take up 24 hours to completely dry. Over-the-counter antifungal powders can help keep the feet dry and may help healing. If they have athlete's foot, you do not want to have them soak in the foot bath and you want to refer them to a physician or get a physician's note when they come back saying they're clean. Onyxchomosis is going to be a fungal infection of the natural nail plate. Its common form is whitish patches that can be spread, scraped off the surface of the nail. Another common form of this is going to be um, long whitish or pale yellow streaks within the nail plate. A third common form causes the free edge of the nail to crumble and may even infect the entire plate. These types of infections often, often invade the free edge of the nail and spread towards the matrix. So they also give you a did you know and I highly recommend purchasing this book because I read this in cosmetology school and I learned a lot. It's going to be called Nail Structure and Product Chemistry 2nd Edition by Douglas Shun and it's going to be published by my lady as part of the Cengage Learning. So you do want to educate yourself on this. I always say um, take anatomy classes if you can. If you can take an audit at a local community college, you'll learn a lot about all these disorders. Take a microbiology course, um, YouTube things. Learn as much as you can about these conditions so you can learn to identify something and differentiate. While you never want to diagnose what a client is going through, you can kind of um, get an idea of what you're dealing with. They say that their nail has been shedding or they have lost a nail. Know that it is not normal for a nail to shed like we shed teeth. That's just not how it is. Um, if you notice a funky odor coming, it usually smells like sour grapes, it's usually bacterial. And if you notice that the fungal nail is either really weak and breaking or brittle or has a layer of scale on it, that's something that is fungal that you're dealing with. If they have um, psoriasis, usually you want to give the client the benefit of the doubt and take their word for it. Um, but if you notice that you worked on someone and you're, you end up developing nail disease, it might not be psoriasis. And that's where it becomes a whole gray area of when to ask them to go to a physician. I always say err on the side of caution. If you notice that something is up with them, refer them out. So um, some of these conditions too, like the perionychia a staph infection, it can be very lethal. It can cause amputation to be needed. Anyone with diabetes or a chronic um, condition like that um, is at a greater risk of serious infection or amputation. And that's always something to keep at the back of your head um, because what if this client um, gets really sick? You don't want it to be on your watch. So please read that book. It was a great read. I enjoyed it a lot. I know this is a lot of stuff to take in at once and this chapter is always one of the chapters that students have a hard time with because it's a lot of science, a lot of terms, and everything is kind of connected. Uh, my own personal opinion, I wish that they would have start the chapter with the physics, then go into the chemistry, then go into the biology of the anatomy and physiology, and then go into the disorders. Because usually um, when you understand the physics, how something generally works, you can then build upon the chemistry, the biology, and then how the systems work together. That's my ideal um, learning process for the whole thing. Um, you can even do that in your own time. I know that some cosmetology teachers, myself included, we kind of jump around in the book, which I know may not be good, but you know, you can easily cover one or two of the chapters in the front and go on. Just know that you are always more than welcome to read ahead in the book. You don't have to wait until you um, learn something. If you read it once and you're exposed to it again and read it a second time, you will learn it better. Don't get discouraged. Don't get stressed out with all these different terminologies. And if you don't do good in the test, that's okay. I did not do good on the um, nail disease part when I was in cosmetology school and I still passed the state board written the first time. But just become familiar with this, do the Cengage online. And the next chapter, which I know a lot of people love, myself included, because this is where I totally geek out, properties of the hair and scalp chapter 11. This will build the basic foundation for all the services that we do. And this will also become a basic foundation for all of your continuing education, um, product education that we'll do in the future. Because once we know how the hair and the scalp works, we will become better um, consumers as professionals on what we invest in product-wise because you can kind of know on when to call a bluff on a product that may claim to do something once you know how the ha hair and scalp work, what the anatomy is like, how the hair's growth cycle is. Um, but anyhow, I'm getting ahead of myself. One thing I am shocked too is that my lady did not separate the disorders and diseases of the hair and scalp. They all did it in one and I thought that was pretty cool. Um, but they technically could have done that. Um, so take a nice break, and tomorrow we are going to be covering Chapter 11, Properties of the Hair and Scalp. I hope you guys enjoyed this lecture on the nails, disorders, and diseases. I know it's a lot, and I hope I did a good job. I know a lot of you are liking my videos on this. I'm getting a lot of good feedback, and I really appreciate you guys. You students keep me going to work every day with a smile on my face, because I really enjoy it when you guys learn something, and I hope that I can learn from you. 
So have a wonderful weekend. If it's a weekend for you guys, if you're gonna relax, just relax, um, unwind. Um, I always make my videos to maybe watch a chapter or two per day. I would never expect anyone to watch an entire thing. I know we all learn differently. And as um, cosmetologists, we, um, we're always a special group because we always learn um, as visual learners, maybe hands-on. We want to get our hands out there and get our hands in something. And I know that this might be the stage in cosmetology school where you're dealing with all the theories and you're like, when can I just get my hands in something? I totally get it. So I'll see you guys soon for chapter 11.